If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter 4 tonight. And um, it's been a good year. God's faithful, right? He's faithful. Let me pray for us. We'll jump into the scriptures tonight. God, thank you again. We do just want to bless your holy name for never failing us, God, for um, never forgetting us. Thank you, God, that you always do come through, and sometimes it doesn't look like what we expect, but God, we know that your will is always good. It is always good, and it's worthy to be rem- remembered. God, help us to not forget all of your faithfulnesses. God, help us to, to count them. Um, God, to take inventory of how good you have been, not just over the course of a year, but over the course of a lifetime. And we pray, God, that as we remember and as we commit ourselves to recalling just how faithful you've been, that it would silence the enemy, God, it would silence his lies, Uh, we would be strengthened in our faith, and that we would have boldness and courage to move forward as we look back and declare you have been good, and then as we look forward, we're able to say you will be good. And so we trust you tonight, God. Bless our time in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know how you guys wrap your year up. You know, sometimes I was with a friend a couple of days ago, and I said, hey, man, so uh, how are you wrapping your year up? And he said, well, you know, I mean, I'm not necessarily sure, right? I mean, he just kind of came off of a period of time where he was able to really reflect on how the year went, and so he did have his own inventory inventory during that time. But for me personally, um, I always do when I get to the end of a year, um, I take I- an inventory of the year, and um, I want to make sure, first and foremost, that everything's cleaned up from my house to my relationships to my own personal life. I don't want to carry, in other words, listen, I don't want to carry things into the new year um, that, you know, would somehow hinder me in my walk with God. In addition to that, um, I do like to look back on the faithfulnesses of God because I am, I am a guy that's always like, hey, what's next? What are we doing next? What's the plan for this coming year? And the danger of that sometimes is um, you can, man, just like speed right on by all the good things that God has done and not really s- spend the time necessary to just consider how good he's been. And so, you know, what, what I've been doing over the, the last week, and I'm still working on it, is going through my calendar, because sometimes, honestly, as I get older, it's, it's harder for me to remember all the different things that God has done. And, and um, so I go through my calendar and, and just just you know, take inventory, take note of the great things that God has done, the big things that he's done, but then also, and I don't need the calendar for this, um, also the small things. And I'll just tell you guys, frankly, uh, it takes time for me to do that. It takes time, like really sitting in the presence of God and meditating and, and shutting the phone off and making sure the TV is not on and closing the door and, and really giving adequate time and space for the Spirit of God to speak to me. And you know what's interesting um, is this is this idea of taking inventory and remembering the faithfulness of God. Um, this isn't something obviously I came up with. This is, this is a practice that was established in the Scripture. In fact, this was what God wanted the children of Israel to do, not just on a, a one-time basis, but consistently he had uh, the, the desire, he had the intention, it was something he wanted for the people, for them to be able to have moments where they would memorialize his faithfulness, and then they would have something to look back on and say, oh, you remember when God did that. And not only would it strengthen the people in the moment and in the future, but then it also gave them opportunity to communicate to generations down the road Uh, Because you know what God does in your life is not just for you, church. It's not just for you. It's not just for your personal consumption. Oftentimes, God will bless us so that in blessing us, we can 
bless other people. And really, that's, interestingly enough, that's kind of how the story goes tonight. Um, it's a fascinating chapter, and and, you know, if, if you've read through the book of Joshua, which is just a great thing to do, um, sometimes this is kind of a forgotten chapter because, you know, we're like, oh, mo- big things, right? Moses dies, and Joshua's raised up, and, and uh, the Jordan waters subside, and the people cross over, and then there's Jericho. And this, this chapter sometimes gets skipped, but it's really, really important. And so tonight, jump into the scripture with me. I'm going to read the first seven verses, and... And uh, we'll talk about it. The Bible says, When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place, check just check the detail out here, where the priest's feet stood firmly. And bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel." That this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. If you're familiar with this portion of scripture, you know these were the stones of remembrance. Oftentimes that's what they're called or memorial stones. And as I said, um, this just uh, certainly wasn't some insignificant detail or duty that God had given to his people. I mean, this was really, really important. He wanted them to be able to look back on this moment and to be reminded, to set up a monument, to select 12 men, one from each tribe, uh, that they would go to the place where the feet of the priests were standing miraculously on dry ground, right? I mean, at this point in time, as we studied last time we were together, maybe you remember, maybe you don't, but the banks of the Jordan during this particular time of year would have been overflowing. Uh, And so back in this day and age, uh, there were times where literally the Jordan was uh, a, a mile from, from uh, one side to the other side of the river. And so we're not talking about a little, a little creek or you know, a little trickle of water like the Jordan is now. This would have been a, a pretty significant miracle. And the heaping up of these waters, as of course you remember the, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, when they stepped into the waters, the waters began to subside. But the subsiding of the waters happened about 19 miles north. So it wasn't even as if they were able to see this miracle of waters heaping up right before their eyes. They just had to trust that this was what God was doing, and and he did work the miracle. And so where the priests were standing, there was dry ground. And the instruction from the Lord to Joshua, from Joshua to the 12 that were selected was, go find a stone, and uh, each of you grab a stone, put it on your shoulder, and then you're going to take it to the place that... Uh, We're going to be lodging overnight. We'll talk about where that place was in just a minute. But they gathered the stones, uh, they placed them together, and they made a monument, um, a place of memorial. You know, I I really do enjoy going to Washington, D.C. We haven't been there for a while, uh, but there was a point in time where we were going once a year, and Rachel's mom lived there, and her sister lives there. And I would leave, not because I was trying to avoid my mother-in-law, but, you know, I would, I would leave for a day, I'd jump on the train, I'd head down to D.C., and, um, and I, I would normally have a book, like a history book about the founding fathers, or, or you know, I'd, I'd take, you know, a copy of the Declaration of Independence, which I have on my phone, and I just would go and spend the day, like, cruising around D.C. and, and reading a book uh, right there on the banks of the Potomac. Um, and going to various memorials. You know, I love the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's something that's so interesting, right? Because it's a piece of the past, uh, but it was established so that we would not forget what was done in the history of our nation. It, it took a memorial because you guys know 
it's so easy for us to forget the past. And when you forget the past, you are doomed to repeat the errors that were committed in the past. And so these memorials, you know, they have uh, great significance because we can look back and oftentimes our hearts are moved. And if you do go to the Lincoln Memorial, you see the second inaugural address of Lincoln right up there on the wall. And I mean, it's profound and it's moving, it's extraordinary. You can see his faith on display. Um, But really, it is memorializing something great. And that's what these stones were. They were making a a memory. It was was monumental what God did. And it wasn't just monumental in the sense of what God did for the people, which is true, but it was monumental in the sense of what God did in the people. Remember, it wasn't just as if the miracle was done for the sake of the miracle. God was shaping the hearts of these Israelites. And and listen, don't forget, I mean, this was a long journey for them out of the bondage of Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea that had been supernaturally parted and, and then all of the various things that God faithfully did as he brought them to Mount Sinai and was raining bread from heaven and water came from a rock and the bitter waters of Marah were made sweet when Moses cast the wood in the water. And then they got to Sinai and the law was given and then of course they went up to Kadesh Barnea and there were 12 spies that were sent into the land and 10 came back with a bad report, two came back with a good report. Joshua and Caleb, hey man, this is exactly what God said it was gonna be. A land truly flowing with milk and honey, grapes as big as pomegranates. And then yet the other 10 were, were like, man, this is, this is not good, this is bad. You know, we've got a bunch of King Kong Bundys, Andre the Giants, for those of you who are old and remember WWE. E, WWF, whatever, whatever it was. There's just big dudes in the land and, and there's no way we're gonna be able to subdue it. And, and just as the way it so often is, the people chose to believe the bad report, the false report, the report that was missing faith, the, re- the report that had taken God out of the equation. They had chosen to believe that. I, listen, I just wanna say to you tonight, um, you're gonna have Lots of people bringing reports to you about what it is that God is or isn't doing. And, and oftentimes, you know, the, the voice that is, that is the voice of fear, the voice of doubt, um, the voice of consternation, the voice that is laying out all of the problems and, and, and pulling God out of the equation. I just want to say to you, as you start this year, make sure that's not the voice that you listen to. Make sure that's not the voice that you listen to. I will tell you that I think that, is a, that voice is prominent in Christian circles today. That voice is prominent on social media, right? That, that voice seems to have an understanding of everything that's going on in a cultural sense, but the interesting thing is, so, so often, um, it, 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 that voice pulls God out of the equation. It's not, a, it's not a voice of faith. It's not a voice that's anchored in what God is doing and the faithfulness of God. It's not a voice that is going to the end of the book, the book of Revelation, and reminding the people of God, hey, listen, you don't have to stress out. You don't have to be turned all upside down because in the end, God wins. He's a good God. He's a faithful God. We got a lot to pray about. We got a lot to seek God over. There, there's a lot that we need to see God do, but listen, in, in the midst of it all, uh, we can be sure that even though the storm may be raging, the boat may be rocking, Jesus is with us. And I want to encourage you to remember that voice. At any rate, um, God was doing something in the lives of the Israelites. They, they, of course, did not listen to the voice of faith that came through Joshua and Caleb, and as a result, they, they wandered, they just walked in circles in the desert for 40 years until finally coming to this point. Of, of course, as I've mentioned to you, uh, all of that is a picture of the spiritual life. It's a picture of the life of the Christian as God rescues us and delivers us from our sins as that is expressed, the reality of what God has done in delivering us and forgiving us and the new birth spiritually that we have all expressed in baptismal waters, God feeding us through his word, filling our hearts to overflowing with the Holy Spirit so that out of our innermost being flows torrents of living water. 
And then the choice that we have either to have hearts that are not really engaged in what it is that God is doing or having a heart that crosses over the Jordan into the spirit-filled life. And that's what we want. You know, as God was bringing them to the other side, he was essentially saying to them, hey, and then the water subsided, right? And then the waters came back. He was saying to them, that life is over. The life of wandering in the desert, the life of being half-hearted in your walk with me, that, that, that life where you were choosing to walk in doubt instead of faith, where you were choosing to walk in fear instead of being courageous, you know, that, that life is a thing of the past, and now you're entering into the promised land. Well, these stones were a reminder of God's faithfulness to bring it to pass. I want you just to consider a couple of things when we think about remembering the faithful work of God. The first thing is this. You know, God said, select one man from every tribe. Uh, and I think, I think two things here. I think, number one, the work of God was personal, Everything that God did was, of course, for the individual. There was an individual experience that each Israelite had as they crossed over the Jordan, as they walked past the Ark of the Covenant, as, as the waters had subsided and they, they were faithfully brought to the other side. Each of them had their own individual experience, but they also had a corporate experience. They experienced this together as the people of God. And so when God is calling them to remember, he is saying, you need to individually remember, but you also corporately need to remember. You know, when we gather together as the people of God, there's an individual experience that we have as we're, as we're seeking his face and sitting in his presence, and thank God for that. Thank God that he speaks to us and to our hearts, but you know, there's a corporate experience as well that we have as we gather together and as we remind each other of how good God has been. And you know, this was really what he wanted the children of Israel to begin to do corporately. He wanted them to be a people that remembered his faithfulness, remembered his goodness. They were having a pattern established in their lives. And you know, God would say many times to the Israelites, don't forget don't forget the good things that I have done for you. In fact, going back, we remember that Moses said this. Let me just give you a couple of, of examples of how important it is to remember the good works of God. Moses said in Deuteronomy, all these are from Deuteronomy, remember, he says to the children of Israel, remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. He says, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He said in Deuteronomy 7, you shall not be afraid of them. You shall dwell, excuse me, you shall not be afraid of them. You shall well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. Deuteronomy chapter 8, and you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 8, 18, but you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make provision. I think that this is why remembering the faithfulness of God is so important, because it, in, it encourages you when you're faced with fear. Like when you, your heart is overwhelmed with a situation that is out of your control, what do you do? You remember, you look back and you remember, it's not about your control anyway, it's about God who's in control. You look back and you see how he has come through time and time again and it silences the fear in your heart. It's important to remember because when you do remember, it, it protects you when you're attacked by the adversary. You know there is an adversary and he is seeking to undermine your faith and he, he's never going to be encouraging you to trust God, ever. He's gonna be the voice that is the discouraging voice. He's gonna be the lying voice. He's gonna be the voice that wants you to be consumed with all of your circumstances and all of your struggles and all of your trials and he wants to quench any hope that's in your heart. There's an adversary that you're fighting against, and, and when you're in the midst of the battle, it's just good for you to look back and, and to say, no, no, wait a minute. Those, the, I am not, I am not, I am not going to believe the lie. I'm not going to believe the lie. I'm not going to listen to the voice of the devil. 
I'm not going to listen to how he undermines my God, who is a faithful God. And how do I know that he's faithful? Well, certainly I go to the scripture and see all that he's done, but I can look at my own life time and time again and see his demonstrated goodness. He's a good God. I think it's good to remember because it guides you. Remembering the faithfulness of God guides you when the way is unclear. You know, when you're spinning and you don't even know which way is up. I think about, you know, when you're surfing or body, uh, body surfing or uh, boogie boarding, you know, and you get a, there's a big wave and the wave wipes you out and you go down and sometimes you're spinning around, you don't even know which way is up. Sometimes you'll start swimming down because you think down is up when up is down and you kind of just have to let go and let your body float to the surface. Well, that's not what you do when, when you know, you're seeking guidance for decisions in life. What you do is you turn to God. You look back and say, God, what have you taught me over the course of the years? I mean, does, does anxiety and stressing out over confusion in your life ever lead you in the right direction? I mean, it, it doesn't for me. I have to sit in the presence of God. I've got I've to shut down all of the other voices. I've got to open the book. I've got I've to allow the presence of the Spirit of God to bring me to a place where I can hear him so that he can guide me and direct me. You know, when you look back, you remember how it is that God has led you. It anchors you. I think that remembering is important because it comforts you when, when you're alone. Man, when you're lonely, when, when you feel like everyone's abandoned you, when you're in that spot where it's like, man, I don't have anybody. Well, going back and remembering how good and faithful God has been to you in those hard times, when you were walking through the valley of the shadow of death and it was, it was just you and you were alone, then all of a sudden you recognized and realized like David did, man, it is your rod and your staff that comforts me. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear evil because you are with me. God, you've always been there. Even when I felt like you're not there, you've always been there. I see it in the past, and because I see it in the past, I know it's true for my present. Amen. Well, we're not done. I think it inspires you when you're struggling to praise. You know, you come into the house of God, and you're like, man, I don't have anything to praise God for. You know, I mean, you just got that sassy, sour attitude, and it's like, you know, you're looking at other people's lives, and you're like, God, why haven't you blessed me like you blessed them? And God's like, why don't you just shut your mouth? No, I'm just kidding. I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes that needs to happen, but sometimes it's like, hey, why don't you just stop? Stop, stop your coveting. Stop your jealousy, stop the envy, and start looking at my blessing. How about you number your blessings? Like just start taking an inventory, and pretty soon what happens is your attitude departs from being self-centered, and you recognize, oh, God, you've been so good to me. You've been so good to me. You inspire me to praise, not just because of, of who you are, and that's first and foremost why we praise him, but also because of what you've done. Hey, finally, I just want to say this. Remembering is important because it empowers you when you share your faith. It empowers you. It empowers you when you share your faith. You're not just talking about a two-dimensional God that is a, a, a God that's just in this piece of literature that we call the Bible. You're talking about the living God. You're talking about a God who hasn't just worked in the past 2,000 years ago. You're talking about a God who's working in your present today. You can say, hey, let me tell you what he did. He lived a perfect life. He was incarnate. He died on the cross. He rose again. And he transforms life and lives. In fact, let me tell you how he's changed my life. And then all of a sudden, your, your testimony, your witnessing becomes personal. And it's powerful. Or when you go through a difficulty and God lifts you up and encourages you or provides for you or something like that, you have the opportunity to encourage other people, not just with a, a principle or a point from the scripture, but you can say personally, let me tell you what he's done in my life. And you know, you know how meaningful that is? You know how meaningful it is when you open up your own life and share with others what God is doing for you and through you? But it won't happen if you don't remember. 
You know, a short memory of God's faithfulness is a powerful tool in the hand of the devil because it gives him the advantage of tempting us to question God's character. Let me, let me just say it again. A short memory of God's faithfulness is a powerful tool in the hand of the devil because it gives him the advantage of tempting you to question God's character. Like when you choose not to remember, what happens is the devil leverages that. And, and now you're just in this place where you're untethered from the faithfulness of God. And he's like, yeah, you know what? God's never been good to you. And God's never come through for you. And God isn't going to be faithful today because he's never been faithful in the past. And if your memory is short, you're not equipped in the arsenal of saying, no, 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 wait a minute. He has been good to me. Remembering God's good works in your life is like building a security wall around your faith. And so I want to tell you tonight to take the time and do an inventory of this year. Do an inventory of this year. I really appreciate the details of this, how uh, they were instructed to find the stones that were in the exact place where the miracle happened, right? The details are super important. It wasn't like, hey, just pick up any stone from any place. It doesn't really matter. Joshua's like, no, I want you to go to where the feet of the priests were standing on dry ground, to the place of the very miracle, and I want you to grab a stone. Each one of you, you're going to grab one stone, and you're going to put that stone on your shoulder, and you're going to carry it to the place that we lodge, which ended up being Gilgal, which, by the way, was eight miles away. <laughs> eight miles away, right? I mean, that is... I don't know how big the stones were, but if he's saying loaded on your shoulders, I'm sure, I'm sure they were big. You know, this was a, a meaningful memorial, and it took work, it took effort, it took thoughtfulness. You know, they carried it all the way to Gilgal. Gilgal became very significant for Joshua. It was the headquarters of the children of Israel as they were conquering the land. And so there was this, at, at headquarters, there was this pile of stones. And it was a reminder every time they went out from that place to fight a battle, they were able to look at the pile of stones and say, you know what, this is what God has done. He brought us here. This was not our idea. This was, this was God's idea. And God, God has been faithful. Now, I think other nations, when they pass a pile of stones, they probably were like, well, what a pile. What a pile. But, you know, not to the Israelites. For the Israelites, it's like, what a memory. How good is God? I just, I just want to say, you know, memories of God's faithfulness in your life, there may be others that say, well, that's just a pile. But for you and for me, it's meaningful. It's meaningful. And no one, no one can steal away from you the good things that God has done in your life. So don't ever let them, all right? This is your homework, all right? I want you to, I want you to think creatively. There are all sorts of creative ways where you can take inventory of the blessings of God before this year is over. For instance, you can journal. Um, you can journal on the Notes app on your phone. Um, you can journal in a journal with a, like old school journal with a pen. Uh, and I think, you know, sometimes that's good because I use my phone all the time. I use my Notes app all the time. But, you know, when you're using your Notes app, you'll have text messages and, and notifications and social media stuff will pop up. And there's no real way to sit in the presence of God and meditate when all that stuff is happening. But I want to encourage you just to journal. Or, or maybe for you, take pictures. If you go into... Um, one of my offices on the walls, I have pictures of our Awaken events and our missions events, and, and those to me are memorials of the faithfulness of God. I can see them. I can see the faces of specific people that we've ministered to and people that I've ministered with, and it's just a reminder to me of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. I mean, you can use your social media. I think what a great way to use a social media feed is to have it as a memorial to God. No one needs to know what you're eating for breakfast, church, all right? No one needs to know that. No one, no one needs to know, like, you know, the, the stuff that you're buying when you're down at wherever you shop at. What, what they do need to see is an um, expression of the faithfulness of God in your life. And then that becomes a platform for you to share the gospel. Mark a date. You know, I'm coming up on 
on three decades of knowing the Lord, man, it's, it's hard to believe, but that happens at the end of January for me, and it's a date that's been set aside, and it's a date that's super meaningful. And maybe for you and, and your friends, you can, you can make a, a, a memorial out of a date, or maybe for you and your family. I just, I'm, I'm just saying to you tonight, I'm sure you get the picture at this point, since we've spent half of our time talking about this, Before the year is out, make sure you take inventory of the faithfulness of God and then give him praise. Well, the Bible says in verse 8, moving right along, And the people of Israel did did just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan. So, so Joshua had another 12 stones placed right where the priests were standing in addition to the 12 that were taken to Gilgal, verse 9. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day, for the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything, check this out, was finished, until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. So, you know, what we see here is uh, kind of a, a chronology, a chronicling of the details of how this was carried out. I think it's easy for us as we read verses 8 to 10 to think, man, you know, this is kind of superfluous, right? I mean, Joshua hears the commands, he gives the commands, and then the Bible details how the commands were carried out. And it's easy, I think, sometimes to think, think, man, that's just excessive. Like, why why all the detail? And I would say to you, uh, it's not superfluous, and the details do matter because obedience always matters to God. Like, it is important for you to see that as the command was given, God also chronicles the obedience of the people. It's like he finishes the sentence because, you know, that sentence isn't always finished by us. Sometimes the command comes, but obedience doesn't follow. And so as we're reading the scripture, what we're learning is To really please the heart of the Father, we need to choose to walk in obedience. I hope, I hope this year that one of your New Year's resolutions, if you're that type of person, is to live a life that blesses God. I mean, is that is that what you've thought? Has that crossed your mind? I mean, I hope so. In addition to all the other things, God, I want to lose 10 pounds. God, I'm just going to ask, please, even though it might be impossible genetically, grow grow me some hair. You know, grow me some hair. Um, God, I re- would really like to advance in the workplace, um, advance in my education, grow the network of people uh, that I would consider friends or acquaintances. Hey, okay, all that's great, especially the hair one. But, but above all, man, like, like let's make the intention of living a year that's a blessing to God. God, I want to please your heart. I want to please your heart. You've been so good to me. I've chronicled. I've done an inventory. I've checked it out. And God is above and beyond. You've spoiled me as your child. I'm born again. I'm I'm born again. I'm I'm spirit-filled and washed by the blood. I'm a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. And so, God, I want to live a year that's a blessing to you. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, just be obedient to him. You know, Jesus said it three times Um, as he was in the upper room with his disciples, and he said it three times because he wanted them to get to to the, he wanted them to get to, it's going to come out. He wanted them to get the point. He said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And then he said again, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And then he said one more time, just in case they didn't get it, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. I don't think this is superfluous. It mattered to God. That's why it's included in the canon of Scripture. Obedience is always a blessing to the Lord. Well, the Bible goes on to say, the people passed over in haste, and when all the people had finished, uh, for those of you who notice patterns, that's the third time I think that the word finished has appeared so far in, in Joshua 4. And when all the people had finished passing over the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people, the sons of Reuben, 
and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Of course, you remember this crew of people. Um, they wanted the inheritance on the east side of the Jordan River, but the agreement was, well, you're going to send your brothers to fight the battles on the west side of the Jordan River, and then you can go back and have your inheritance on the other side. You remember that. We studied that in Joshua chapter 1. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel as Moses had told them about 40,000 ready for war, passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel and they stood in awe of him just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. So, so, We'll talk about this in just a minute, but what you'll notice here is uh, finishing is a common theme of Joshua chapter 4, and bringing things to full completion is something that always matters to God. Now, one of the reasons why God worked such a significant miracle was he promised Joshua, hey, just as I was with Moses, so also I will be with you. I mean, I can't imagine what it would have felt like to take over for someone as significant as Moses. I mean, all of the things that God did through Moses' life, who could ever measure up to that? And this was what God is saying. Hey, Joshua, you don't have to. Like, you know, the plan here is for you, is not for you to work in your flesh with your own strengths and your own capacities and try to reach the level that Moses was at. That's not what he does. He says, you just need to chill. You need to be obedient. You need to trust me. And as I work the miracle, this is what's going to happen. People are going to recognize that it's not you, it's me. And by the way, that's what made Moses so significant. Moses wasn't so significant because he was so smart or had such great capacities. Moses was significant because God demonstrated his power through Moses' life. Just like it says in Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, not by power, not by the might of man, not by the power of man, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Hey, remember, any time someone is being really used by God, it's significant because they're being used by God. It's not significant because Somehow they're special and and they stand apart from everybody else because of the skills they have or the tools in their toolbox or the intellect that they may have. Those are all blessings that ultimately come from the Lord. But, but But for Joshua, it's like, hey, listen, I'm going to prove, I'm going to show that just as I was with Moses, so also I'm with you. You don't have to toil. There's no pressure. It's not about performance. You don't have to carry the staff like Moses carried the staff. I'm sure that, that Joshua sometimes was like, okay, how did, he, how did he walk? How did he fluff his white beard? You know, because you guys have seen the movies. Um, how, how, did, how did the Shekinah glory thing work? And is, is there some kind of makeup I can put on that's going to that's gonna make me shine like Moses, you know, shined? I mean, there's that tendency to want to emulate all those things as if that's what it's about. But that's not what it was about. I want to encourage you tonight, let God be the one to raise you up. Let God be the one to raise you up. You don't have to toil in your own efforts. It's not about your personal performance. It's not about you like imitating somebody else that's well respected in the culture. It is about you just simply submitting yourself to God and allowing God to show himself strong on your behalf. And by the way, that's a Bible verse. I don't know if you know that. Second Chronicles 16.9 says this, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose hearts are blameless towards him. And I I love that, man. It's like God's looking. God is searching. God wants to, like all all this intimates that God wants to show himself strong. God wants to use somebody and what is he looking for? Well, he's looking for someone who's, whose heart is blameless, not sinless, but blameless before him. Or the New King James Version says, a heart that's loyal towards him. A heart that's like, God, you know what? I'm living for you, and I'm living for you only. All I want is intimacy and communion with you, and, and here I am, like Isaiah said. God, here are my hands, and here are my feet, and here are my eyes. 
Help me to look on those things that only please you. God, here, here's my heart and here is my mouth. And, and Father, I'm just giving them to you as an offering for you, Lord, to use however you desire. No strings attached. I'm trusting in you. God's like, man, that's, that's my girl. That's my girl. You know, that's my boy. I'm going to take that life and I'm, I'm going to use it. You know, sometimes we think that God is looking. He's like, who's the smartest? Who's the prettiest? Who's the most networked? Who's got the um, IT skills? Who's got the business background? And, and God can use all that stuff. But, you know, God does not, God doesn't choose like man chooses. Don't ever forget that. The Bible says in verse 15, And the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priest bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priest, Come up out of the Jordan. And when the priest bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. What I love here about these priests is that they finished the job. They finished the job. I mean, this was not, this was not a short task, right? They're, they're standing uh, in the place where the waters have subsided. They're carrying the Ark of the Covenant while two million people, I, look, I can't, I don't even have the patience to sit at a stoplight, church. I'm sorry, I have to confess it. You know when you're, can I complain real quick? <laughs> Dude, you know when you're sitting in a stop, stop light and, and you know you're waiting, right? You're waiting. You're, in fact, you're looking, you, you shouldn't be doing this, but you're looking at all the other lights. You're like, oh man, I can see that's, that light's still green and you're waiting for it to turn yellow. And it's not even your light. It's not even your light. And you're like, okay, it's yellow, and it's red. And then, you know, you know the amount of time it takes from that turning red to yours turning green, it's like, it's like there's a pause. There's a pause there which some of you take advantage of and you actually know that happens so you drive through the red light because you know the other people's lights aren't gonna be green. Well, you're, you know, all of a sudden your light turns green and you're waiting and, and you're looking at the person in front of you and, you know, and they're doing their makeup in the mirror or, or they're looking down and you're like, that person's on their phone. And so you know, you wait one second and two seconds, and then sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's three whole seconds, and, and you know, all these thoughts are coming to your mind, and now you're like wondering if you're even really saved, you know, because <laughs> sanctified people don't have these thoughts, and, and you're thinking, you know, you're thinking of saying stuff that you can't even imagine. These thoughts haven't, like, come to your mind for years because you've had to wait for three seconds and then finally the person goes and you know what you do is you get in the lane that they're not in whether it's the slow lane or the fast lane and you drive by and you know you, you give one of those looks like you know what you just wasted three seconds of my life you wasted three seconds of my life and and you know you're all you're all you're all put out and you're frustrated um, because yeah, this is just the way that we are. We're super impatient. We're super impatient people. I mean, I think back to the day when, you know, you had dial-up modem for internet access. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Like it was 56K a second or something like that, right? And most of you don't even have a clue what I'm talking about right now. And, you know, because we're in the me megabytes and we're in, in the gigabytes of download per second. And, but what I appreciate is, getting back to the Bible, what I appreciate is, man, they stuck it out. They, they stuck it out. They waited. I mean, this was a long time for all these people to cross over the Jordan. And I think, what I don't, I don't think they were like, really? Are you kidding me? I'm so put out. This is so inconvenient. You know, I mean, I'm hungry. I, I want my dinner. And can't you walk faster? And, and get your kids under control. I can't believe they're running down the river. I mean... I think that, I think they were just faithful to the Lord because they were honored and they were privileged to be carrying out the purposes of God. I love how the scripture is so thorough at declaring that these leaders saw it all the way through. They saw it all the way through. They didn't quit. They didn't give up. They, they weren't just discouraged at the adversity or the obstacle. And, and so, you know, they, they took their toys and 
and went their way. They didn't do that. I mean, they saw it all the way through. The Bible's really very specific in Joshua chapter 4 about how God finishes things, but it's also very specific about how true servants of God finish things as well. We live in a culture that's all about personal desire. We live in a culture that's all about personal desire. Big on personal desire, low on faithfulness to God. And so, okay, I will be faithful to God until, until it gets difficult, until there are obstacles, until there's adversity, until we're confronted with the closed door, until we run into someone we don't like, until you know, we have that situation where you know, it's a little embarrassing or we don't think God came through the way that we wanted him to come through and now because it doesn't fit within the framework of satisfying our own desires, we think, well, you know what, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I'll throw on the towel. Now, I'm talking not just about serving God. Of course, we could obviously talk about friendships. We could talk about people being committed to a community of believers. We could talk about marriage, you know, in the church. There's just such a lack of a willingness to be committed to God through the difficult times. And yet, that is exactly what identifies us as true servants of the Lord. I want to encourage you to be faithful. I want to encourage you to see it through. I want to encourage you not to give up. You know, I'm going to be sharing at a conference next week, and, and the title of the conference is The Open Door. Um, I've picked as my title, The Closed Door, because that's just the kind of person I am. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a challenger, and so someone's got to talk about it. I'm, I thank God for the open door, but you know, if, if, you're, if you're talking about an open door, and it's like the ingredients of that, it is one part open door, five parts adversity. And by that, I just simply mean anytime God calls you to something and is going to do a great work, there is a lot of adversity that comes with it. And so you have to determine in your heart that you're going to see it through, not just for the sake of seeing it through, but for the sake of realizing that ultimately this is about your commitment to the Lord. God, I'm going to be faithful because you've been faithful to me. God, I'm going to be I'm going to see this through because you're the one who's called me. And so whether it's adversity or difficulty or obstacles or you're dealing with my ego or you're dealing with my pride, God, I'm not going to run. I'm not just going to pull up and bail to take my nonsense to the next situation and then to have to go through the same thing again because the truth is this, it's not the circumstances, it's my heart that you are dealing with. And you are trying to sort out all of the stuff that's on the inside and popping from place to place and avoiding the real issue is never the solution. It just postpones the inevitable. I want to encourage you tonight to be faithful with what God has called you to and see it all the way through. Finally, verse 19, the people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took up out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Uh, finally tonight, I just want to mention as we wrap this up, uh, it, it is interesting that the particular day is given here, the 10th day of the first month. And for those of you who are Bible students, you know from Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, um, that that's when the Paschal lamb was sacrificed all the way back in the land of Egypt. And so you remember it was the 10th plague that was about to be poured out on the whole land of Egypt. And the firstborn of every household was going to die as the angel of destruction came over those homes. And the instruction was, take the lamb, take the lamb of sacrifice and make that sacrifice and dip the hyssop in the bowl and sprinkle the blood on the 
doorpost and the lentil. And when the angel of the Lord sees the blood that's been sprinkled, the angel of, the, uh, of destruction will pass over in mercy. It was on that day, 40 years later, that they entered into the promised land. Not a detail missed. Not a detail missed. In fact, I'm sure that they remembered, you know, God was faithful not only to bring us out of the land of Egypt, but to bring us into the land of promise on that specific day. And I'm sure there were moments for 40 years where they're like, man, what is this about? What is this desert stuff about? Tumbleweeds and scorpions and snakes. And you guys know what I'm talking about because, you know, you live in a desert the heat and the dryness, and they didn't have chapstick, okay? They didn't have air conditioning. They weren't on luxury buses cruising for 40 years. They were living in tents. I mean, it was not easy. And it could have been, you know, that they were thinking, man, all of this adversity, what's it for? What's it about? And yet, as God wraps this whole thing up on the very day that the lamb was offered, they were reminded it it, it all had a purpose, It was all working out to God's intended end, even in the midst of their own unfaithfulness to God. And so I wanna encourage you, maybe you feel like you're in the midst of a wilderness. Maybe you're in that spot where it's like, man, God, what is all this for? Don't forget, God knows exactly what he's doing all of the time. And that was for them. It was for them. It was for them and it was for the generations to come, right? This, this stone memorial was to be a place where fathers could say to their kids as their kids were walking down the road at Gilgal, they'd see this memorial and they'd say, hey, dad, what's that all about? And the dads could say, hey, this is so good. I'm glad that you asked me. This is what God did for us. God is faithful. I just want to wrap up tonight by encouraging you to share the good works of God with your children. I mean, you might not have children, but maybe someday you will. If you do have children tonight, the most important thing that you can do is to tell them how good and faithful God has been to your family. You know, what's the, what's the last thing that God has faithfully done for you as a family, and are you sharing that with your children? Do you have those moments where it's like, hey, kids, we're gonna stop right now, and we're just gonna acknowledge that God's the one who did this, God's the one who's provided, maybe you, maybe you get a house, you know, and it's like, hey, God provided for this home. Or maybe when you sit down at a meal, you know, you're reminding your kids everything that we have has been handed to us by the good provision and faithfulness of the Lord. Or maybe, you know, you're sharing with your children your own journey, how God rescued you and, and delivered you. They need to hear those things. I think sometimes as parents, you know, rightfully so, it's like, Hey, we need to provide for our kids, and we want our our kids to be educated, we want them to have opportunities. Yeah, that is true, but we want them to be disciples of Christ. We want them to know the Lord. And you can give your kids everything, but if you miss that, you've missed the single most important thing. And this is for sure for moms and dads to do. Maybe you're a single parent tonight. That responsibility for sure uh, can weigh heavily on you as a single parent. Um, But for mom and dads here tonight, maybe that's your situation. Fathers, I want to encourage you, like the Bible is specific here. It's presented in the masculine. And so what that means simply is this. It's not for the man to abdicate this responsibility to the more spiritual person in the home, which normally is the wife. Normally it's the wife. Normally, it's, you know, mom who's walking with God and loves the Lord and, you know, is the one who's like rallying the troops to go to church and saying, hey, you know what, can we serve God? How about we read the Bible? What if we pray together as a family? Because sometimes, you know, dads abdicate that responsibility. Well, that's not how the Bible presents it. The Bible says that fathers should be leading. Fathers should be leading. We should be the ones who are lovingly directing our children to the Lord and not abdicating that responsibility. And, and you know what? Making memorials to the faithfulness of God. I pray, thank you so much for sticking it out with me tonight. I pray that as you take an inventory this year, that you know the Spirit of God reminds you, not just of the big things, 
that God has done for you, but man, the small things, and you know, maybe some unseen things. Maybe there are some things that God's just gonna say, hey, you know what, you didn't know this, but I wanna tell you, I wanna tell you what I was doing in your life, like behind the scenes. Give yourself an opportunity to sit in the presence of the Lord and to hear that, and then use that as a foundation. As you move into this new year, make it a year without fear because you've chosen to stand on the faithfulness of God. Let's pray together. Amen. Father, we're thankful tonight for every good thing that you've done in our lives and, and forgive us. God, forgive us for forgetting. Forgive us, God, for our short memories. Uh, Father, forgive us for how we stress out in the moment and lose sight of your steadfastness, your relentless love, God, your generosity and kindness. I pray that, God, you'd build up our most holy faith, that we would be steady, in spirit, that we would be faithful in adversity, that we would be courageous like you've called, like you called Joshua to be courageous. Because God, you're with us. Father, we wanna just end this last Bible study of the year with praise and worship, God. We wanna let it ring out we want to ring out this year. We want our hearts wrung out with praise. And God, we want to bring the new year in by honoring you with worship. You're worthy, God. And so receive this tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.